We thank you, Lord, through this house fire as well, this lightning strike, God, that your word tells us that all things turn out for good for those who believe, Father God. And so thank you for that, Lord God, that all things, Lord, work for good. And we just love you and we give you glory and we give you praise, Lord God. And we say amen. Amen. Lord, we do thank you so much for the privilege that it is to be together this morning. And, um, Lord, you know all the things that got us to this place. God, you know where we are. You know the things that are distracting to us. But God, you deserve our full attention and our full praise. You deserve our hearts laid down before you. And so, Holy Spirit, we just pray in these very moments that you would make yourself known to us. That you'd overtake the complexities of every single relationship and situation and concern that we have, that you would remind us that you're at the center, that we walk in step with you, that in you we live and move and breathe. Just come in these minutes, quiet our hearts, that we could focus fully on you and who you are. We desire for this time to be a time that pleases you, that lifts up the name of Jesus. We desire, Lord, to be in communion and worship together for you, for our voices to be one. God, we desire to edify each other in this fellowship. God, to be edified in our hearts and our spirits by your word and this teaching today. And God, we need you. We need you to do exactly that. So Holy Spirit, come in power. Empower us. Stand with us this morning as we sing together. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You are our living Lord. Your presence is. I've tasted and the sweetest of us when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your
blood will never lose its power. Your cross and what it represents won't lose its power. God, your love will never lose its power. God, we hunger and thirst for you in this place right now. We glorify you, God. You're worthy. Worthy, Jesus. it is to be in your presence again you're so faithful and so good to us and God this morning we pray this same spirit of worship would be with these kids and those teachers God in big house all over this place God that your spirit would be at work to bring your kingdom on this earth in our hearts and in our lives God we love you so much and we thank you for this time I want to ask you right now as we get ready to dismiss our children, if it's because of the cross of Jesus Christ that you're alive, if he has given you life and you want to give him some praise, we want you right now to try to give him the amount of glory that he deserves. Give it to him right now. As the children make their way out, and we are so blessed with these little guys making their way out. Give a hand to these little men and women that are out here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, as they make their way out, um, we normally pay, pray for parents during this time uh, in general. But today, um, we're going to specifically pray over moms. Um, and some of you are single moms. There are moms who have been single their whole lives who have actually fostered and adopted children in this church family. We have some amazing moms. But we're not just praying for moms. Um, we're praying for single women um, in this uh, church who have never been married and will never be married and are blessed, um, as Scripture says, that, that their full devotion can be just straight to Jesus. And it's just such a gift in that. But we have some amazing women in this congregation. And so I want to ask you um, if you are near a woman who you're married to or in a relationship with, um, that it wouldn't freak them out for you to just lay a hand on them, um, that you would do that. Um, if not, if you're a guy and you just want to let, hold your hand up over the women around you. Um, brothers, we're going to pray um, a prayer of thanksgiving and blessing over the women of this congregation. Lord God, we thank you so much that you have blessed us with the gift of, uh, of some absolutely amazing women. Lord God, those of uh, us who are blessed with wives who are amazing and, and, and many of us have been blessed with mothers who are amazing and daughters who are amazing, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you so much for the single women of our congregation who honor you in their lives. And God, we want to pray for the single woman who's struggling right now with uh, loneliness or struggling with her own purity, Lord God. We want to stray for pray for the woman who's desiring to have a child and has not um, and is, is struggling with that. We pray for the mom who's riddled with guilt because of because she feels like a mistake she's made in the past. We pray for every woman in this place that, that what you would do, Lord God, is what you had in mind for them when you were knitting them together in their mother's womb. Lord God, if that's to be just, just full on for you their whole lives long and and if, um, if, if being a mother never becomes a part of their life, we thank you, Lord God, that that in no way, in no way keeps them from just having awesome 
tremendous, powerful, wonderful uh, value and contribution and difference-making work that God threw their lives. What a gift. What a gift, Lord God. The gift of the singleness of, of women who are single in this place. And thank you for, for the gift of those women who are married, that you would make them phenomenal wives. And those who are uh, mothers, that you would make them great mothers. And we pray a prayer over all those who have guilt, that their guilt would be taken away by the blood of Jesus. That it just be just right now in this moment free. And Lord God, that by your Holy Spirit, you would pour out a love into their heart that's supernatural. That it would just cause them to bring you glory in all that they do. And as we pray for the women in this congregation, we just want to say, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for them. In Jesus' name. And now, men alone, can we give a hand for the women in this congregation? <laughs> Um, for, for the women, um, the reason I really felt the Lord prompting us to pray over the women um, is if you don't know it, we have a phenomenal women's ministry in our church. Um, our, yeah, right? And um, uh, we have a women's night of worship. Um, it is a fantastic opportunity. Women's night of worship. And that is going to happen next Sunday evening. Our brothers and sisters at, um, at uh, Carolina Force Community Church open up their church home to us. We're going to be having that once a month. It's fantastic. So all the women at 5 o'clock, you gather for fellowship. At 6 o'clock, you're going to have worship. It's going to be fantastic. There's going to be child care. Um, many of you as husbands are going to be taking care of your children at home. For those who don't have husbands who can do that, um, then, then there'll be child care. So we hope that you'll come and be a part of that next week. Um, it's going to be absolutely um, outstanding. So we now have a great privilege, and that is you showed up here today with an expectation that, that God was going to just be, be here and move and speak. And all he's going to speak so powerfully today through Steve is, uh, as he's bringing a word to us. If you're on the aisle, would you just slide in a little bit because some people are still coming in. And if you would just slide in, if there's room for you to slide in and make an available seat on the aisle, then those who are coming in can make it. Um, now, Lord God, we pray that as Steve comes, that you're going to speak powerfully through Steve to all of us. God, it's because of the cross of Jesus that we're alive. And God, we just thank you so much for your presence in this place. And we believe, God that you are already speaking to us, and we believe that as Steve comes, you're going to take it to a whole nother level. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, after three days of sitting, they, uh, they, they start slowly making their way to a standing position. It was time for them to go ahead and leave and, and head home. And they would get up and they would start to head out. It's a long journey home. They're in a very remote, desolate kind of an area. And they will get up just kind of in awe of what just happened. And they will start making their way out. There's 12 of them that aren't quite leaving yet. They, they, they have baskets picking up all the leftover pieces. And as the people are leaving, they will go and they will shake a hand and pat them on the back and just say, thank you. I, I can't believe you were able to feed everybody. It was awesome. And the 12 would just be speechless. It's kind of rare that Peter would be speechless, but he's speechless because he doesn't have any answers either. He, he has no idea what just happened. But as the crowd gets up and as they leave to head home, they're getting the thanks. Great job. And they will just nod an appreciation because they can't, they can't explain what happened. They, they don't understand what happened. And it's my prayer for me when I open up Scripture, and it's my prayer for you that every time we get into God's Word, whether it's here on Sundays or in any kind of group, in C groups or life groups or whatever it is you're in over the week, that you would get into this and you would just have the same mindset as that, is that we would look at this and we would say, what in the world just happened there? And how does this apply to me? Because we have people disciples who were walking with Jesus who didn't understand. And I don't know if that's of relief to anybody else in here other than me. I mean, the people closest to Jesus, seeing all the, hearing all the teaching, seeing all the miracles, they didn't understand. And maybe that's where some of us are today. And maybe as we dig into his word, we can ask, how in the world did this happen? And how does this apply to me? And we have Mark chapter 8. Good morning. It is good to see y'all this morning. 
Hey, it is good to see you guys this morning. Thank you so much for being here at Christ United. And those of you who are watching online, whether it's on a computer screen or a TV at a welcome party or a house party or a watch party, whatever we call it, man, we are so glad you guys are tuning in. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we are in the book of Mark today, so go ahead and get your Bibles out. We encourage you, if you are new, please, please, please bring your Bibles. We will tell you where to go so you don't feel weird because you don't know where, where it is. We will tell you we are in the book of Mark. It's in the New Testament. So go towards the back of your Bible. Look for the guys' names you can pronounce, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They're towards the back, big books. We're in Mark chapter 8. And if your Bible glows, that's perfectly fine. Go ahead and turn it on and put your finger on Mark 8. That's easy, 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 easy. Um, while you're trying to flip it and find it, let me kind of catch you up where we are in the story. If you're following along this year, we are going through the Bible in a year as a church. And this week we started reading the book of Mark. And Mark is just like a great action story. Mark doesn't start with the birth of Jesus. He goes right into adult Jesus. And it's just like all action. And he jumps into all the miracles and the teachings of Jesus. And it's great to so just kind of get us in the mindset of where he is. We're going to leave Socasty, all right? So pack up. Kid, kidding. We're going to leave Socasty and, oh, here we go. And we're going to go over to the Sea of Galilee, all right? So we're going to go all the way over here. Oh, yeah. Wave to some friends there in Italy. All right. And we're going to get down here. That was the only one I knew. <laughs> hey, don't laugh at that. Right. And so here he is. He's up on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And when he starts his ministry, he is around the nation of Israel, or he's around where the Jews are. That's, the, that's where he is. And he starts teaching. And he starts doing miracles. And we see where up here he feeds the 5,000. That's up where around the area where he walks on water. And he starts gathering a huge crowd. And of course, this kind of infuriates the religious people. They're, they're called the Pharisees. And they start coming down and they try and test Jesus and question him because he's got a crowd bigger than what they have at their church. And, and they want to kind of, they don't like what he's doing and taking their crowds of people. So they test him. And all the time we see, and they will go to him in, uh, I believe it's chapter 6, and they start testing him about what's clean and unclean. Because you see, for the religious people, everything for them is what's clean and unclean. That's kind of what you go through in the, in the first you know, few books of the Bible. And they are living by the letter of the law. And they will question Jesus about what's being, what is clean and what's unclean. And Jesus is just like, you guys have got it all wrong. See, for you, what's clean and unclean, you're talking about like hand washing and what you eat. He was like, I'm not talking about clean and unclean when it comes to eating. I'm talking about your heart. And they just don't get it. And these religious people, these Pharisees would say, if you aren't a Jew, then you would be unclean. And Jesus, almost to prove a point, will leave the area of the Jewish people. And he will go down into the Decapolis area. Okay, y'all didn't say anything. All right, um, so you're not Jewish. Okay, so somebody did it because you know me, right? Yeah, all right, so he goes down to the Decapolis area. All right, you're catching on, but you're a bunch of fakers still. So, so b because we're not good Jewish boys and girls, we have to understand, he goes into this Decapolis area, which is this area, it's a Gentile area with 10 cities in it, right? So this would be, unclean people according to the religious Pharisees because they weren't Jewish. And almost to prove a point, Jesus leaves the area of the Jewish people, goes into the Decapolis, this area of 10 cities where these people aren't Jewish. And the religious leaders would have thought, what are you doing over there with the dogs? Is how they would call them because they are unclean. And Jesus says, I got to go there. Because I've come for people who you think are unclean. Because what makes people clean and unclean isn't what they eat or how they wash their hands. It's the condition of their heart. So he leaves the area of the Jewish people and he goes down and he does some of the same miracles he did for the people that the Pharisees would consider clean. He does the same miracles for people that they would consider were unclean. And we have Mark chapter 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse along the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, 
<laughs> but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. I find that kind of funny. Right? I mean, 4,000 people have been, have been sitting down for three days in a remote area listening to the teachings. Church, don't you ever, ever again think it is okay to send me an email that I preach long. <laughs> We're done with it. I hit the 35-minute mark. Y'all start like, you know, stretching, looking at the clock, being like, how long is this guy going to go? We got plans after this. We're leaving for the last song. That's it. He says, I mean, we're out of here. I mean, they're sitting for three days. And, and yeah, they, they probably brought some provisions along the way. No one brought a, a three-day U-Haul. They are out of food, and Jesus knows this. I mean, three days, they just sit there and listen. I wonder how long y'all would last. You know, I get into my second hour, my third hour, my fourth hour. I think I'm really hitting my sweet spot. My wife puts up her hand and be like, babe, I'm the only one here. Right? <laughs> and I know y'all are like, Steve, you're not Jesus. Good point. In fact, I want you to highlight or circle or underline the first words in red. I have compassion for these people. Here are people who all they would have heard from the Jewish people was, you are unclean, you are unworthy, you are dogs. And here is God in the flesh in Jesus right in front of them, not just speaking to them, but having a heart of compassion towards them. He understands them. He understands the relationship or the lack thereof, the condition of their marriage, the finances. He understands. He has compassion, the sickness, whatever it is. He has compassion for them. And they're there on day one just listening to this heart of God that has so much compassion for them. And as the sun starts going down on the first day, they're probably like, all right, we're going to pack up and head out. Word gets back. He's going to be here tomorrow. We're staying. And for three days, they stay there. And they're out of food. And he turns to his disciples. And he's like, man, we should feed them. Because if I send them home now, they're going to pass out because it's a long journey home. And of course, the disciples just look around. And they're like, um, we don't have what it takes to feed these people. There's 4,000 people here. We don't have what it takes. And Jesus asked just like a ridiculous question. Well, how many loaves do you have? It's like, oh, yeah, we forgot about the three semis we have in the back, you know, with all the, I mean, it's like, how many do you have? The end of verse 5, seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, circle, highlight, underline, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks, circle, highlight, underline for them also, and told the disciples to distribute them as well. The people ate and were satisfied. And at, sorry. He told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. At, people, there's something missing here. <laughs> Don't you want to know how this happened? Am I like the only one? I mean, how does it go from, hey, what do you guys have? And they come back with seven, you know? So he's like, hey, what do you guys have? We know we don't have what it takes, right? But he asks, what do you have? And they go around and they're like, we got seven. That's what we have. Because we have to remember, the, their loaves of bread weren't like 100-foot Subway sandwiches here, people, right? <laughs> they, they were like travel-sized things. They were like Twinkies, Right? He was like, hey, what do you guys have? Well, we know we don't have what it takes, but we've got seven. And he goes, all right, we're going to give thanks. And then scripture just says, and everyone was satisfied. Look, I say all the time, I think the Bible can be a little long at times. In fact, if I wrote it, it'd be three pages, mainly pictures, right? But this is one of those where it's just like, I, I think there should be some more here. How did he do this? 
right? I mean, this is one when I get to heaven, I want to rent and watch. And you guys can come over, we'll have a Twinkie party, it'll be great. But I want to know how he did this. I mean, did, did he kind of put them all here in the middle and be like, all right, guys, I'm going to give thanks. You might want to stand back <laughs> a little farther and just like, boom, mount the Twinkies, right? I mean, I, I mean, how did he, did, did he just take a Twinkie and like break them and put them in each of the disciples' baskets and be like, all right, each of you have a section, go. And they go and someone takes a Twinkie and then another one's there. How did it happen? I mean, did, did he take a Twinkie and have a basket and he just start breaking it off and it never go away, right? He's just like, <laughs> I, I mean, did, did he just take a flake and put it on people's tongues and it's like, boom, oh, I'm so full. <laughs> oh. oh, what, that's fish? No, thanks. I had enough Twinkie. I'm good. I'm good. I mean, how did this happen? How do we go from this ridiculous seven amount and 4,000 people are filled and satisfied? I don't understand. I would love to know how this happened. And you know what would be happening today if we knew how it happened? You got it. We'd be having Tuesday evening Twinkie services everywhere. Right? If we had five verses of how Jesus took the seven loaves and multiplied it to feed 4,000, we would be trying to recreate that forever. He's like, I don't want you to get caught up in the miracle and miss the message. Amen. How he did it isn't important. It's not the point. It's not the point of the message. He's like, look, I want you to have a heart of surrender towards me. That's what I want. Because the disciples knew they didn't have what it takes. And if you have a note sheet and you want to follow along, we're going to point out some things along the way as we go. And number one, this is a Jesus who knows we don't have what it takes, but still asks for what we do have. He knows we don't have what it takes. I mean, really, what in the world could we even give to God to impress him? I mean, he is the creator of everything. He has breathed out stars. I mean, we breathe out gas too, but it doesn't produce stars, right? I mean, what, what could we possibly give him? He knows we don't have what it takes, but he still asks for what we do have. He's just looking for a complete heart of surrender. He's like, look, I know you don't have what it takes, but will you give me what you do have? I kind of wish my, you know, growing up in high school that my teachers were this way, right? That they just came into class, handed out tests and be like, hey, tests are out here to everybody. Just want you to know you're all going to fail. I'd be like high-fiving. How's it feel to be me, people? Yeah, right? I mean, we don't have what it takes. But the cool thing is we would still fail, but his work in and through us allow us to pass, and he doesn't want us to miss what he's talking about by getting caught up in the miracle of what happens. He's like, look, I know you don't have what it takes, but will you give me what you do have? Will you surrender your life to me? Will you surrender everything you have to me and just see what I can do? Because my love that's come from God is for all people. It's not just the Jewish people. It's for all people. And if you give me what you have, man, we will make an impact for the kingdom of God if we will surrender what we have. And it's not to get caught up in the miracle. And secondly, if you're writing this down, this is a Jesus who does not need us, but he delights in using us. He did not need the disciples to feed everybody. He didn't. He didn't need them at all. But man, he delights in using them. And as a dad, I try, and, I try and tap into this because God has invited us to call him, you know, our heavenly father. And as a dad with two kids, I just think of all the times, it's just like, man, you know, my, my girls are awesome. I love them and they'll have friends over to the house. And, and it just seems like, uh, you know, I, I want to pick up stuff. And, you know, we, we got to get the house ready because they dance like literally all through the house. So you got you to clear paths and everything. And, and most of the stuff we're at the house is theirs. Any, any other parents other than me? Right, yeah, and, 
And I just love the day when I'm in there and I'm like picking up their stuff and my oldest will put down her cell phone and just see dad working and we'll just come in and then we'll actually grab her sister off the computer and be like, come on, we need to help dad. And they just come in and they just say, dad, we're here to help with whatever you ask. I mean, that day's never happened, but... <laughs> I'm a man of great faith. There's, you know, they'll come in and move like one thing and be like, oh, I'm done. It's like, no, the, come on. This is your stuff. Your friends are coming over. You, you, would you just right, go back to your room, right? And on a, come on. As parents, it almost goes easier and quicker without them half the time, right? But I enjoy being with my kids. I enjoy being around them. And we have the heart of God is like, look, I don't need you. But man, I delight in being with you. I delight in being part. I delight in you giving me what you do have, even though you don't have what it takes. I have joy and delight in using you. Even though you don't have what it takes, will you just surrender what you do have? And that's the heart of what he has for his, for his people. He just wants a pure heart of surrender, even though they don't understand what's happening. And they feed the 4,000 with just a little bit, and the people were satisfied. Verse 8, afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 people were present. And after he had sent them away, he got into a boat with the disciples and went to the region of Dalmathuna. So they're over here on the right side of the Sea of Galilee, and they're going to leave the Decapolis area. Boo. There. Yeah, you're delayed. All right. And they go over here to Dalmanutha on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, right? So, and it's only about eight miles. It's about the... the the widest part of the Sea of Galilee. And he goes back, and Jesus goes back over to the area where the Jewish people are. He had just performed this miracle of feeding the 4,000 of these Gentile people. You'll catch on some point. And he goes back over to the area of the, of where the Jewish people are. And as soon as he gets to the dock, he's confronted by the Pharisees once again. Verse 11. And the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him, circle, highlight, underline. They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to you or will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed the other side. Well, that was a short trip. Ooh, hey. I didn't even want it there, but hey, I appreciate it. Yeah. Short trip. He gets back over to his people, the Jewish people. And as soon as he gets there, you have the Pharisees testing him, saying, hey, we want you to pull off a sign to prove you are who you say you are. We, we, we need to see a sign. And Jesus sighs. It's only the second time so far in the book of Mark we see that Jesus sighed. The first time is in chapter 7 when he comes face to face with a man who is deaf and blind. And he sees the brokenness of humanity, and it says Jesus sighed for him. Now he comes face to face with the religious rulers, and he sees the brokenness of religion. And he sighs. They should get this before anyone, and they don't. They're asking for another sign from heaven. And he says, all right, you guys want a sign? All right. We're going to use the boat. All right, my 12, get in the boat. You guys ready for your sign? All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. And, and I just picture the Pharisees on like the dock looking out and being like, that's the worst disappearing trick ever. <laughs> we still see you. <laughs> He's like, I'm not going to give you a sign. And he rose away. And I don't know what the disciples are thinking here. I don't know if they're like, you couldn't have just done one more? I mean, really? I mean, Jesus, you could have just like put up a hand. All the fish from the Sea of Galilee could have popped up and be like, he is Lord. And they go back under and they'd be like, we're in. 
You couldn't have done just one more? And he just rows away. And as they're rowing away, the disciples forgot to bring bread, except for one loaf that they had with them in the boat. Verse 15, be careful, circle, highlight, underline. Jesus warned them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Now, if you're not a baker, you may not understand this because right now today, we can just go to the store and buy some yeast. Back then, whenever they were making dough and they were making bread, they would have to pull some of it apart and kind of leave it on the side on the counter. And then what would happen is the next time they want to go and bake bread, they would go and get that yeast that's been pulled apart because it's fermenting. It's almost like a bacteria. And they put it with the new dough. And they do that so that way it infects the entire loaf of bread. And we know that because it rises. The whole thing does. So he's like, you guys need to be careful. Don't have an attitude like that. Don't have a hardened heart of testing God. Because if you're just going to test him and ask him for signs, you know what you're going to get? Because he's like, they just have a hardened heart for me. And he says the same thing about Herod. The only difference is Herod is just not doing it as, as a religious way. These guys are all about themselves. And he's like, you need to beware to not have an attitude and a heart like that. Because number three, this is a Jesus who knows just a little hypocrisy can corrupt the whole thing. He knows that just a little bit of hypocrisy can corrupt the whole thing. He's like, guys, you have to understand, you can't have even a little bit of that in you because it'll harden your heart and ruin every bit of you. I, I don't know, you guys, you know, live around here. Anybody else have ants in their yards? Yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, we'll have these ants, and we have this cool pest control people that'll come out and spray the ants, and, and one time they came out, and I just follow them around, you know, and, uh, and I see them spraying this stuff on the ants, and it's just, it's like a nice day, and it just seems like these ants are like a day at the beach. They're just like, you know, backstroking in this stuff, and all their friends are coming out, and I'm just like, aren't they supposed to die? And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, they will. And I'm like, for the current owners of the house or for the next owners of the house? I'm just, do you have anything for like the current owners, right? Because it seems like they're just having a field day. And, and he's like, look, th th this is how it works. See, they're going to like this stuff and they're going to swim around in it, all of them. And then they're going to take it back down and infect the entire nest. And it'll be gone. And Jesus is like, you got to be very careful of having, an, having a heart and an attitude like that towards God. Because it will take root and ruin everything about you. It'll harden your heart because he knows just a little bit of hypocrisy can corrupt the entire thing. So beware of that yeast of the Pharisees. And of course, right after Jesus says this, and he's basically telling the disciples, when it comes to the kingdom of God that we are living in right now, everything you see and everything you hear, don't make it about you. Don't make it about you. And of course, very next verse, the disciples make it about them. <laughs> he said, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. The disciples, verse 16, they discussed this with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? Just care. All right, all right. So, you know, we only brought one of these. Is it because we only brought one of these? I'm, I'm just, you know, did we do something wrong here? I mean, we, we, did, we had seven, and we, you know, we had a whole basket full of left, and we, we only brought one. Man, why do we only bring one? It must be because of this. This is what he's warning us about. And look, when it comes to verse 17 on, I don't know how Jesus says this. I don't know if he's cool, calm, and collected, but there's eight questions here that he asked the disciples in a row. And I don't know if he's just, hey, guys, and just ask them questions one through eight, or if he's kind of a little, uh, and he's just like, bah, 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 and just like free firing at him. I don't know. But aware of their discussion, 
Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? Do you have ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many of basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? I love the disciples. They're just like, one word answer, 12. <laughs> We're not saying anything else. We know that answer. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Seven. And that's it. And then he said to them, do you still not understand? End of conversation. You guys are with me. And do, do you not get what it is I'm doing here? Do you not get that the love of God that I'm representing is for all people? And I know you don't have what it takes, but I want to use you to reach people for the kingdom of God. And if you follow along your note sheet, there's just some lessons from the loaf here. Number one, when asking for a sign from God, we may be getting the silence of God. When asking for a sign from God, we may be getting the silence of God. And we see that with the Pharisees. Their hearts are hardened. They've already made up their mind. They're not there asking God for direction or, or how to you know, become closer in relationship to God. They're, not a, they're there to test him. And the sign they get He's just like, I can't do anything with that. I can't do anything with a hardened heart. And for some of you in here, that may be right now your, your attitude towards God right now. It's just hard. You've kind of made up your mind. And my prayer is that that would be broken and open today. Because if all we do is make this life about us, our power, our position, our prestige, we're missing it. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were, they were only concerned that Jesus was going to take their power, their prestige, their position, because he was a threat to them. And he's like, you want a sign? I'm out of here. And that's the sign they had. So when asking God for signs, we have to be careful of our condition of our heart because we might just be getting the silence of God. You see, Jesus didn't die on the cross to bless us. He died on the cross to save us. You see, instead of asking for a sign, number two, let's just get rid of our sin. That's what he wanted for the Pharisees. Would you quit thinking you are righteous? Would you quit thinking you are the clean? Would you, would you get rid of that? Would you get rid of that out of your heart? That, that, that's what he's looking for. He wants them to get rid of their sin. And I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of this. It's just, man, so many times I'll ask for a sign from God. And I wonder if he's just asking me, well, I've given you my word. Why would I show you another sign if you're not even obedient to what I've already given you? Why? Why would I show up and give you a sign that you're asking for when right here I've given you a sign for 2,000 years how to come closer to me, how to walk in obedience with me, how to get through hardships, how to deal with the, with the anger, the unforgiveness. When I have already taught you how to do this, why would I give you another sign when we're not even obedient? I know I can get there. Do we realize who in Scripture had the most signs from God? the nation of Israel. And even still when he appears, they're just like, give us another one. And this even goes back to the Old Testament when the nation of Israel was captive to the nation of Egypt. God shows up and does all these amazing plagues, these 10 plagues. They were there and they were a part of it. And then as they're leaving Egypt, the splitting of the Red Sea, they're there for that. And then they're out and... And then in uh, Exodus 19, they get to Mount Sinai, and God says, I'm going to give you a glimpse of my power. And right there is Mount Sinai, and they see thunder and lightning and fire come down, not come up out of the mountain, come down onto the mountain. And they're just like, oh, we're in for 40 days. 
After a sign like that, after seeing the 10 plagues, the splitting of the Red Sea, man, we're free now. We're not in slavery. Seeing the, all this fire and thunder and lightning come on top of the mountain, they're in for 40 days. And then Moses is up on the Mount Sinai for 40 days. They think he's gone, so they make an idol and have an orgy. 40, I mean, we need to not be focused on getting a sign from God to be more focused on getting rid of our sin because we might just be getting the silence of God. And lastly, number three, the mark of a real follower is not knowledge or attendance, but a changed heart. The mark of a real follower is not knowledge or attendance, but a changed heart. You know who in the story has the most knowledge? The Pharisees. And we, we always tend to paint these guys as bad guys, and, and I, I get why. But we do realize that in Scripture, these were just the guys who were the most devoted to God. These Pharisees, they had the first five books of the Bible memorized, and they were devoted their entire life, every single day, to following every single letter of the law. They had more knowledge than anybody. But their hearts were hardened. <laughs> they, they had the best attendance in church but their hearts were hardened. And it's not that knowledge is bad and it's not that attendance is bad, but those things in amongst themselves is really of no value. He's looking for a heart change. Because I don't know if you noticed, the disciples also are a little confused and don't understand, but their hearts are opened. You know what, even though they know they don't have what it takes, what do they do? We're just going to surrender what we have. God, we, we don't know what you're doing. We don't get it. You know, there's 4,000 people here. We've only got seven. It's no, there's no way it's going to feed. You can have it. And Jesus is like, well, you can stay in the boat. I don't know if that's any of you today. With what you're going through with your marriage or the health scare or the finances or the job or the lack of the job or the relationship with your kids or lack thereof, I don't know where you are, what obstacle you have hit today. And he just says, I get you may not understand, but will you stay with me? Will you keep walking with me? Will you just surrender what you do have left? Will you just walk and surrender with me and just surrender what you have? because we don't know what he'll do with it. It'll be for his glory and for his kingdom. And God, I just want to surrender it all, regardless of how little I see it as. God, it's yours. And he's like, keep leaning in, keep leaning in, keep leaning in. And they're with him in the boat. And it's just kind of funny, because Jesus referenced do you have eyes and don't see? Do you have ears and not hear? He had already done this before. He had already fed 5,000, and now he's here feeding 4,000, and they still don't get it. And he's like, and after this, he actually goes through and heals a blind man. He bookends this miracle with healing a blind and deaf man and healing another blind man. Almost as a saying, will you just see what I'm doing? Will you see how I've been faithful? Will you see what I've already done in your life? Will you hear what I have done in your life and just surrender what you've got? Because I'm here for those who don't think they're good enough. I'm here for those who don't think they are. And if you will surrender what you have, I'm gonna take delight in using you. And you get to be a part of bringing the kingdom of God to people who wouldn't see it otherwise, who think they are useless or dogs or unworthy, that's who I'm going after. Not the ones who think they're good enough. He just asked for our surrender. And I don't know where that hits you today. I don't know if you're one of the people who he fed and you didn't know. You would have had no clue the fact that God loved you so much he sent Jesus to die on a cross for you to cover your sins, to repair the relationship with God that we couldn't have because of our sin. 
I don't know if some of you are in here today and you're kind of like the disciples. And it's like, man, you've hit another roadblock. And you're just like, man, how am I going to get through this? Man, do we have eyes and ears to see what he's already done? And just have faith to surrender what we do have? And if there's anyone in here today who's like a Pharisee who's just like, man, I hardened a long time ago. I'm so glad you're here. And I pray he's already working on breaking your heart and opening up to the possibility that, man, you can't have an attitude of God like that. And if we ask for signs, he's going to row, row, row his boat right across the sea. And as the praise team comes up, that's my prayer for you, my prayer for me today, is that where is our heart? Do we have a heart of surrender towards God? And if not, praying for him to come and give us the strength and the courage and the wisdom to know we don't have what it takes, but yet to still offer in complete surrender what we do have because he is faithful. He has done great things before. He does great things now. He will do, always do great things. And will we remember what he's done and just live in a heart of complete surrender of everything to him.
praise you in this place. God, without your breath in our lungs, we are nothing. Thank you for being willing to breathe life into us. And today, right now, we, we want to take an opportunity for someone who might be in here today who's never taken that breath that he offers of giving you life and making you brand new that your old life is gone and you just want to live in complete surrender towards your heavenly father and for the first time today you realize that there is a God who loves you so much who has compassion for you that he came down to earth And Jesus walked this earth and lived a completely sinless life to pay for the sins you've done and the sins you will ever do. And he took that death on a cross because he loves you so much that he wants to breathe life into you, into your lungs. And if you're here today and you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you can either repeat after me or say it in your own words. And we're just going to bow our heads and you just say, Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for bringing me here today. It is not by accident that I am here right now. God, for the first time, I realized how much you love me, how you sent your son Jesus to this earth to live a completely sinless, perfect life and to take death on a cross that I deserve for my sins. God, I really don't have words, but thank you. And I want to live the rest of my life in complete surrender, knowing I don't have what it takes without your breath in my life. And God, I believe you rose Jesus from the dead three days later, and I pray right now that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. So as I walk through the rest of my days, you are with me. 
as my guide, my comforter, my healer. That I am made new because of Jesus' death on a cross. And it doesn't mean I'm going to live perfect. But it means from this day forward, I will wake up every single morning and I will praise you and I will offer my complete surrender of my life to you. To walk in obedience with you and to live for your kingdom and not mine. Thank you for saving my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And if that is you and you said that prayer, you just made the best decision you could have ever possibly made in your entire life. Your old life is gone and you are made brand new through the blood of Jesus. And we want to celebrate that decision that you made here today. And if that is you, we're just going to go, we just want to ask you to put up a hand if that is your, if today is your day. Anybody over here in this section, today is your day. You are surrendering your life to Jesus. Anybody over here? What about this section right up here? Just put up a hand real quick so we can see you. Oh, where, where? Right there. Woo! Anybody else here in this section, today is your day. You are fully surrendering your life to Jesus for the very first time. Anybody right here in this middle section? Just put up a hand real quick so we can see it. Anybody right here? Anybody right here? What about in this section over here? Anybody right here? All right. For those of you who are here today and you have given your life to Jesus at some point in the past, and today you're just like, man, I just, I forgot what he's done. I forgot what I've seen. I forgot what I've heard. And I want to recommit my life to Jesus. And I, and I want to be used by him. If anybody in here just wants to be used more by Jesus, and today you're just like, I'm in for being more used by him. And I'm going to live in complete surrender from this day forward. Will you put a hand up? Anybody over here? What about right here in this section right here? You want to be used more by Jesus. Anybody right here in this section? What about this section over here? Anybody right here? Right there. Woo! Woo! Anybody else right here? Anybody else over here in this side over here? Sure. Amen. Praise God. Well, that praise goes to God, and we are so glad you were here. We, we, we really are. Um, uh, anybody else that you want, that you either are committing your life to Jesus for the first time, or you are recommitting your life to Jesus, you're a little wigged out, you didn't want to put a hand up, you didn't know what you're, we were going to do to you, anybody else? All right, if that was you, the most important step you can take is as you go out here into this hallway, there is a booth that says, today is my day. Please go there on the way out. We have people there who wanna pray with you, make sure you have a Bible, and more importantly, get you connected with other people walking in a direction that you wanna be walking, becoming more like Jesus. So please don't leave before you step out and do that today. Pastor Jeff. In our new environment, this is such, man, to hear you guys singing praises to God, it is so awesome. We love this. One problem with this environment is we used to have easy access to come to an altar to pray, um, and we don't have that opportunity. And so often that altar, that place of prayer, was not just for those who were giving their lives to Jesus. It was for followers of Christ who God was doing something in your heart, and you really wanted to step out and say, God, I need you and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm wanting to take a step, and I'm wanting you to move, and we'd be able to pray over people. Well, we're going to do that now. We're going to do that now. We're going to start this every single Sunday for this. So I'm going to ask you, I don't know about you, but how many people here, as, as God just spoke so powerfully through, through his word, through Steve, you're thinking, man, God doesn't 
need me, but he delights to use me. And I want to be used by him. I'm like, I really, really, really want to be used by him. And, and I know I don't have enough, right? Um, but I know that if I don't have what it takes, he'll still take what I have, right? Amen. And so, so I'm ready to just say to him, God, I want to give you what I've got. I want to give you all of me, and I want you to use me. And if you had had a chance for somebody to just pray over you and lay hands on you and just say, come on, let's do this together, you would have loved that opportunity. I'm going to ask you to just hold your hand up right now and say, that's me. I'm, I mean, everybody in this place who's saying, God, I want you to move in me. I want you to, I, God, right now, you delight to use people, and I'm one of your children that I pray you will use me. And God, I know I don't have what it takes, but will you take what I have? Will you just take what I've got? I'm going to give it to you. And keep your hand up. Now, if, if your hand is up, I want to ask if you're near somebody who's got a hand up, that you would just lay a hand on that person. And if you're near somebody and you got your hand up, you can put a hand on them and they can put a hand on you. Let's just make sure that right now, everybody who's got their hand in the air has somebody that's just reaching out and touching them. You ready? We're going to ask Steve to just pray for us, to pray for every single one of us, that as we offer um, the loaves that we have, as we offer them what we got, that he's going to take it, he's going to do awesome things in and through us, that he delights to use us, and we're going to be delighted to be used by him. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that although we don't have what it takes, you take joy in using what we have for your yeah. glory and your kingdom. Yeah. God, we thank you that you came for the unworthy. Right. God, I am unworthy. Mm. We offer ourselves to you today. We surrender to you. Yeah. God, please use us. Yes, God. God, we offer ourselves as complete surrender to you. Yeah. And God, with what you've spoken today, God, will you please give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard. Yes, God. And the courage to do it. Yes, in Jesus' God. precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Right? We'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Oh. So, guys, if you, um, uh, when we talk about offering him all that we have, if you're new to Christ United, you notice we don't take up an offering um, during the course of the worship. Um, but, guys, that is, that is such a gift for us to be able to offer what we have to him and watch what he does with it. Um, and so for those who ask every single week, how do we do that? On your way out, you'll see opportunities. On our website, you'll see opportunities. But you try this, taking what he has given you, it's all his, and taking that and offering it back to him, watch what he does with it, right? Let's everybody here who's ready to say to God, all I have and all I am is yours. Use it for your glory. Let's give him some praise right now. God bless you.